Hello and welcome to the Energy Transition Talk, the podcast that explores the challenges and opportunities of transitioning to a low carbon future. In this podcast, we seek to break down some of the most complex and important issues regarding the energy transition and how it impacts us. In each episode, we'll tell a story by bringing you various perspectives about the energy transition so that you can make the best and most informed decisions for you and your communities. I'm Justine, your host for today. So this episode will be a little different from the rest. If you listened to our previous episodes, you know that we usually have three hosts, Jim, Paulina, and me. But for this episode, I decided to do a little takeover, so you'll be stuck with me today. Fortunately, we are talking about energy law, a topic I personally find very interesting. And I'll be talking about it with two amazing guests. First, I speak with Professor Jacobs, an energy law professor at Berkeley Law who gives us a comprehensive overview of some of the most important energy laws at the national and state level that affect our daily lives. You will then meet my law school friend and classmate, Kristen, who worked on renewable energy at a law firm this past summer. And we talk about the state of the energy industry through the lens of a law firm. So let's dive right in. Here's my conversation with Professor Jacobs. Okay, so I am very excited to have Professor Sharon Jacobs on the show today to talk about energy law. Professor Jacobs is a professor at Berkeley Law, where she teaches energy, environmental, and administrative law. Her work has been published in journals including the Harvard Law Review, Yale Law Journal, Columbia Law Review, and Ecology Law Quarterly. Before joining Berkeley Law, Professor Jacobs was an associate professor of law and the John H. Schultz Energy and Natural Resources Law Fellow at the University of Colorado. She was also a Clemenco Fellow and lecturer at Harvard Law School and began her legal career with the law firm Covington and Burling in their energy and environmental regulatory groups in Washington, D.C. Before law school, Professor Jacobs was also a professional cellist. She holds a JD from Harvard Law School, master's degree from the Juilliard School, and bachelor's degree from the Cleveland Institute of Music. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. So I like to start with people's bios and you have a particularly interesting background. So I'd love to hear a little bit about what drew you to law and energy or environmental law in particular. Yes, I have a relatively unconventional background uh, for a law professor. Um, So I grew up in a musical family right here in Berkeley, California. Actually, I like to say I grew up under a grand piano. So I focused on music and music alone from a very young age. And, you know, I loved playing, but it was during my graduate work in New York that I took a few classes at Columbia University. Um, and that opened my eyes to other possibilities. So I'd be in my practice room with the New York Times on my music stand because I was more interested in finding out what was happening in the world um, than I was in preparing my Beethoven sonata. Uh, so I, I transitioned uh, to a different field after I graduated. Um, I interned right here at the Commonwealth Club of California in San Francisco, working on California governance reform. Um, And the beautiful thing is that the law is open to those without traditional backgrounds. So I took the LSAT exam, actually love the LSAT exam. It's one of my dirty little secrets. Uh, And law schools don't seem to mind if you have classes in 18th century counterpoint or American history. So I was admitted to law school and, uh, and loved every minute of it. And here I am. Yeah, that's very, it's not super common where, you know, a lot of students um, enjoy taking the LSAT. So that's really interesting. It's true. It's <laughs> true. I guess the other thing I'll say, since um, part of the purpose of this podcast is to speak to current students, is that I had no idea that I was going to be interested in environmental or energy law when I got to law school. I didn't know what the career options were. Uh, I had a vague sense I might want to do international law since I spoke a little French. But um, what happened was that I found administrative law and regulation, which is essentially the law of government agencies, and was fascinated by that. And then within administration, found environmental law through two really incredible law professors, Jody Freeman and Richard Lazarus. And I was just bewildered by the array of different approaches to law, especially in environmental law, where we have a number of different statutes of the federal area. Uh, They all take a different approach to how we might want to regulate. And I thought that that would provide a rich area of study for the rest of my life. And then I found energy through environmental law because this was the beginning of a new wave of interest in energy law because of its environmental impacts, uh, both at law schools and in legal practice. So setting the stage for this conversation, maybe we should start by talking about exactly what we mean when we talk about energy law and regulations, like what does it include or not include and maybe provide some examples. 
Absolutely. So let me say two things here. Um, the first is your question, like, you know, what is energy law? And we can get at that through the question of what energy means. And the broadest definition of energy is just the ability to do work of some kind. So you can think about it as the way we power our lives, our way of life. But when we talk about uh, energy law and regulation, we're usually much more specific than that. So we're usually talking about the regulation of electricity on the one hand, and then the regulation of non-electric fuels like oil uh, and gas on the other. Um, and another important definitional point here I wanted to throw in is the use of the word law and contrasting that with the word regulation, because law I think of as the whole package of legal tools in a given area. And regulation is more closely associated with the specific work of government agencies that are tasked with implementing what we call statutes, the laws that come out of Congress or the state legislature. So law is the whole package and regulation is what agencies do. Mm. So regulation is um, kind of the way to implement the laws and make sure that they're being implemented. That's a good way to think about it. So that's the first big point is, is definitional. Um, and then I also want to say something about the distinctions between energy law and environmental law, because we frequently see those two things mashed together these days, but they're actually quite different. Environmental law grew out of this history of uh, public health and safety regulation in the 1960s and the 1970s. So it's focused on pollution control. It's focused on the health of the natural and human environments. A classic example, if you want to think about it, is the Clean Air Act, which limits the concentrations of pollutants in the ambient air. Uh, and by contrast, energy law grew out of a different tradition, the tradition of public utility regulation <clears throat> from the progressive era in the early 1900s. And uh, it was mostly economic regulation. It was designed to ensure that basic goods and services like electricity, like gas, were available to the public at a reasonable cost. And to give you an example of that kind of regulation, this is my students' least favorite part of energy law, is learning about the formula that public utility commissions use to decide how uh, electricity and gas should be priced. But as I tell them, it's really important to learn that formula uh, because behind all that technicality is a world of policy choices about what kind of energy system we want. So there's clearly a lot of overlap between these two fields, energy law and environmental law, mostly because energy systems produce a lot of the pollutants that environmental law tries to regulate. That's especially true when it comes to climate law and climate regulation, which involves the reduction of carbon pollution. And a lot of that comes from the burning of fossil fuels for energy production. So there's a lot of overlap, but the two fields evolve differently. And for the purpose of today's podcast, I think we'll try to focus more on the energy law side. Um, so why does energy law matter? Like, Why should we care about energy law and regulations what areas of our lives would they affect? Well, they affect every area of our lives. So I think we should care about energy regulation, both because it determines how we can meet our broader goals as a society, but also because it affects us as individuals going about our daily lives. In California, we've passed laws that show we care about traditional concerns when it comes to energy law. And by traditional concerns, I mean that energy be available, that energy be reliable, that it be affordable. But we've also passed laws with these broader goals in mind, social goals. Um, so we care about the uh, effects on the environment that energy produces. And we care about whether our energy systems place disproportionate burdens on particular communities, especially low income communities, communities of color. So we can use our energy laws as a way of achieving social goals. But then, of course, each of us is also going to experience the effects of energy regulation at an individual level. Uh, and the example I like to think of here is when we decide to pay rooftop solar panel owners a particular price for the electricity that they generate, that impacts all of our electricity bills in some way. Although my colleagues over at the Haas School of Business's Energy Institute here at Berkeley think it doesn't impact them by as much as you might think, um, but it affects all of us. Uh, another example is that when our Public Utilities Commission approves our utilities use of public safety power shutoffs, which is a term that all Californians are unfortunately aware of now. It's when the utility turns off our power, de-energizes the lines to prevent wildfires during high wind events. Um, when they do that, it means your power is not as reliable as you thought it would be. Um, so there are a lot of effects at the individual level um, and we'll hopefully, hopefully get a chance to talk more about some of those. Yeah, definitely. And I think one other thing that, that would be good to clarify is 
um, who is actually in charge of developing and implementing energy regulations at the national and state levels. Like probably most of us have heard of the Department of Energy or the Environmental Protection Agency, but um, are there other agencies that we should be aware of? Oh, it's such a good question. Um, and this is my particular area of interest, but I'll try not to get too far into the mm -hmm. weeds because it's a little bit of an alphabet soup of agencies. Uh, so I'll start at the federal level. We have the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, sometimes affectionately referred to by its acronym FERC. Uh, and that is an agency that's in charge of gas pipeline siting. It's in charge of setting rates for wholesale sales of gas and electricity and interstate commerce. It has uh, a lot of authority over federal hydropower um, and a few other things like mergers between big utilities. But then you also have the Department of Energy, which does things like administering grant programs, like the ones that we'll hopefully get a chance to talk about in the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act. The Department of Energy sets efficiency standards for appliances like light bulbs, which have been in the news a lot recently as people cling to their incandescent bulbs that they grew up with, uh, even as the Department of Energy tries to replace those with LEDs and much more efficient lighting available today. Um, Department of Energy coordinates federal energy research through the National Lab labs and provides a lot of grants and funding uh, for a whole variety of, of different areas. And then I'll just throw in one more at the federal level. You've probably heard of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. That's another agency, but that one focuses solely on nuclear power. So that's the, the federal agencies, and those are just a few examples. But the states actually retain a lot of authority over energy regulation, and California has a better developed suite of uh, agencies and regulations than most states. I'll just give you a few of our state agencies and we can come back to these as we talk about specific policies. California has a Public Utilities Commission, the CPUC. Uh, it sets the rates that you pay for your electricity, for your gas. It approves planning by utility companies to decide what they're gonna build and when to meet customer demand. Um, they try to ensure regulatory compliance through monitoring and enforcement. They license some energy facilities. But then just like the split at the federal level, you also have the California Energy Commission. And the California Energy Commission oversees the siting of power plants, uh, offshore wind development. It implements the state's renewable energy procurement requirements, coordinates energy research and analysis. And then one more I'll throw in, in California, we also have the Air Resources Board. Sometimes we call this CARB, the California Air Resources Board. Uh, and that's the lead agency for the state's greenhouse gas reduction programs, which of course impact energy policy. So there's no reason to remember all of those names. And I think the big takeaways uh, from this is are two. One is that energy regulatory authorities is shared between a lot of different government entities. And two is that states have an awful lot of power to shape how energy is produced and consumed. Yeah, and I feel like those agencies are ones that are kind of under the radar, like they have a lot of influence on our daily energy you know, lives, but um, we don't really hear about them all that much. Is authority, like how is the authority shared among these agencies? Like, do they ever conflict or do they kind of complement each other? They do both, um, and this is one of my uh, areas of interest in, in my own research, especially the way that new agencies get created and added to this mix. Um, so usually statutes will delegate particular responsibilities to different agencies. That means Congress will say, FERC, you do this, Department of Energy, you do that, with the idea being that there isn't too much overlap, but then there are areas where Congress likes to share responsibilities between agencies, which can be good for redundancy purposes. There's a backup. It can also be good because different agencies have different expertise. So an example at the federal level is that uh, transmission siting, which is uh, an, a really important area right now. There's a special program Congress wrote into law that allows the Department of Energy and FERC to work together to figure out how to site transmission lines in areas where there's a lot of congestion or otherwise a lot of need for new lines, but they have to figure out how to work together in order to do that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, narrowing down to national legislation here in the U.S., so to start off overall, what has what goal has the Biden administration set in terms of decarbonizing the grid, the grid? So very ambitious goals, in part as a reaction to the pledges that the United States has made uh, in at the UN. Um, and so the overall goals that we've heard coming out of the Biden administration, they want to decarbonize the United States electricity grid. That means essentially 100% clean energy um, by uh, by 2030. That's very ambitious. 
um, and also decarbonize the transportation sector by 2050. Uh, and again, that's going to help us meet our commitments in the Paris Agreement. Uh, and, and so then the question is, you know, how do we get there? Right? How do we get to net zero by 2050, again, consistent with international goals? One of the big things that we're doing at the national level uh, is putting money in the hands of companies and academics and researchers to try to build out the clean energy economy. So that's through a law called the Inflation Reduction Act that was passed in 2022, uh, the IRA, which is in many ways the largest climate package in US history. And it invests about $370 billion in clean energy and climate over the next 10 years. Uh, that's huge. And the hope is it's going to reduce our carbon emissions by about 40% by 2030 compared to levels in 2005. I would say this statute is mostly carrot. There's very little stick, by which I mean it contains a lot of incentives and goodies and not a lot of direct command and control regulation requiring people to do specific things, requiring companies to do specific uh, things. So it's got a, just a ton of financial incentives in the forms of loans uh, and, uh, and tax credits, for example. And those things all go to benefit clean generation, like solar, like wind, like geothermal, like energy storage, um, including some slightly uh, more controversial technologies, co uh, technologies that people have different feelings about. That includes nuclear power, that includes carbon capture for fossil fuel plants and hydrogen fuels and other low carbon fuels. Uh, there's also some really cutting edge stuff in there, like direct air capture and sustainable aviation. So the goal is to try to get some of these technologies off the ground. For the technologies that are already off the ground, it's to propel them into a place where they become dominant in the energy sector. And then the statute includes a lot of goodies for consumers too. So, you know, big national goals and then the ways that these things impact our individual lives. There are tax credits, there are upfront rebates for things like home energy audits to install heat pumps in your house, to replace inefficient heating and cooling, uh, for induction stoves, to replace gas stoves, to weatherize. Uh, you can get tax credits for home solar generation, for battery storage, for electric vehicles. So lots and lots of goodies out there right now to transition to the clean energy economy. Um, and that's the Inflation Reduction Act. And I would I would be remiss if I didn't just say one quick word about the Infrastructure uh, Act, the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed earlier in the administration, which makes a lot of investments in clean transportation as well, clean public transportation and charging networks for electric vehicles and upgrades for the transmission system. So we're talking billions and billions and billions of dollars being put towards the energy transition at the federal level. Yep, that makes sense. And then on the rebates, um, just to clarify, so Congress, um, in terms of the individual rebates you'd be eligible for, like Congress passed the act, but then it's up to the agencies to flush out the details of how much those rebates would be, right? So like the IRS, for example, had to update the list of EVs that would be eligible for federal tax credits um, when there are new rules about having a certain percentage of battery components be sourced from North America or specific, or specific um, US trade partner. Yeah, that's right. And that's a really good example of Congress passing quite a general piece of legislation, although it has enough specifics in there so that the agencies understand what their tasks are. Um, and then agencies fleshing out the details. So we know that you can get up to $7,500, for example, for new cars. We know you can get up to $4,000 for used cars. But as you say, there are a lot of details in there about which components have to be made domestically, uh, about different makers. Um, in the last round of incentives, we had uh, uh, thresholds for each manufacturer that once they met them they didn't that, that's a lot of detail to implement and congress simply doesn't have the time or the expertise to do any of that and so agents that's where agencies step in that's where the department of energy works out the details of these rules and these plans gets them implemented make sure that people actually get their incentives for buying new electric vehicles yeah so the devil's kind of really in the details here and i think we'll try to link in the show notes kind of the up-to-date information on what you would be eligible for that's good. There are a lot of good calculators out there right now where you can just plug in your income and where you live, and it gives you a whole list of federal and state incentives you're eligible for. Yep. Great. So I also want to bring up permitting. You mentioned it a little bit earlier, um, the permitting for clean energy infrastructure, since it has been kind of a hot topic lately. 
Um, basically, the idea is that to meet net zero targets, we will need to quickly build out a lot of clean energy projects, including transmission lines to connect this renewable electricity to the grid. But there are a lot of obstacles to getting the needed permits to rapidly deploy this infrastructure. So I'm wondering what are the biggest legal or regulatory hurdles at the federal, state and local levels? Um, why does the permit process take this long? Yeah, so this is um, an area where there's both a lot of reason for optimism in terms of being able to build the energy system that we want, and then a lot of challenges for some very good reasons as we try to build that infrastructure. Um, so I will say one of the challenges here is that infrastructure siting is fractured. So we have some siting that takes place at the federal level. FERC, as I've said, gets to permit natural gas lines, even though those pass through multiple states. FERC does not get to permit electricity transmission lines. Those are done state by state as the lines pass through each state. And then each state has its own rules about how those lines are permitted. And that means in some states that local governments and cities get a say. So it has to go county by county um, or local government by local government. It's really time consuming to get all those permits, as you might imagine, compared to a one-stop shop for natural gas pipelines. And there are some you know, hypotheses about why these systems evolve differently historically. I haven't seen any really good justifications for why they should be different, uh, but those are just the systems that we inherited. So that's one challenge is all the different jurisdictions you have to go through. We also have to think about the fact that when you site energy infrastructure, including transmission lines, but also, of course, big power plants um, and gas pipelines and anything else, that impacts people, right? It impacts their real lives. And so we have to be careful, first of all, to avoid sites that might have special features that impose a disproportionate harms on particular communities, on particular groups, on species, endangered species or ecosystems. Um, but in general, people don't like having energy infrastructure sited near them. And only about 20% of people say that they'd be comfortable with a wind generation facility within a mile of their home. And I always tell that to my students. Then I say, would you, right? Would you be happy if you were told that, you know, right behind your neighborhood, there were going to be 20 giant wind turbines operating at all hours of the day uh, and night? So we have to cite these things somewhere. Nobody wants them in their backyard, and it's a really thorny problem. And to deal with that, the law has all sorts of different requirements um, at the national level. We have something called the National Environmental Protection Act, or NEPA. At the state level, we have a version of NEPA called the California Environmental Quality Act. Lots of states have their own versions uh, that essentially require federal agencies to take a hard look at the environmental and human impacts of any kind of major agency action, and that includes building energy infrastructure, that process takes a long time to figure out what the impacts will be, what their consequences will be in California, what mitigation measures can be adopted to lessen those impacts. It involves a lot of public participation as well, and there are different ways the public can get involved in this permitting process. All of that I think is really good, and all of that I think is really time consuming. So we have this essential tension between the need for speed that many of us feel in building out this infrastructure, and at the same time, these very real and valid concerns that people have and want to raise about exactly what it looks like and where it goes. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm just thinking about like the federal government, they recently halted a geothermal project in Nevada to prevent, protect an endangered toad that like only exists there. So um, even yeah. like, in environmental groups, there are conflicts of so whether to build projects. And this is really a tough question for people who would describe themselves as environmentalists, because we have these canonical cases in the literature that we teach in environmental law and other classes um, about their sort of David and Goliath fights, right? They're these tiny species like the snail darter fish that block giant projects like um, the Teleco Dam and the Tennessee Valley Authority, right? I think you've probably heard this one before. Um, and that is that case uh, has been called a great victory in the environmental law movement. Now the questions are a little bit different because we have toads, right, that we want to protect that, you know, might seem to be the David character, like the snail darter, but instead of a dam with very little power generation capability and no real economic benefit, as far as anyone could tell, 
we have a geothermal project that can produce carbon-free or virtually carbon-free electricity um, for the state of Nevada and beyond. So these are these are hard questions. There are values that come into conflict here, um, and we have to figure out how to work our way through them. Um, we could spend a whole episode on every one of these, but let's move on to the Good. state. <laughs> Uh, specifically here in California, since California is leading the nation in energy and climate legislation, I think also this is where energy regulation gets more, a little bit more interesting. Um, so given the context of California also has a net zero policy, um, in November 2022, California released an updated plan to achieve uh, net zero emissions by 2045 and cut greenhouse gas emissions 85% by 2045. So. What are some energy laws and regulations in California that we should know about and their impacts? Oh, goodness, there are so many um, moving to the state and, and getting back up to speed on everything that's happening uh, in energy regulations, a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. So um, let's see if I could we can separate these out into individual areas for conversation. So first, I think you're absolutely right to start with the big overarching goals that Governor Newsom announced in 2022, right? Carbon neutrality by 2045 um, is a huge one. We also have in the state a renewable energy standard. It's sometimes called a renewable portfolio standard. Lots of states have these. Um, California's is among the most ambitious. That essentially requires our utilities like um, Southern California Edison, like PG&E, to source a given percentage of their energy from renewable sources. And it's been ratcheted up over the years. It was established in 2002. Um, now in 2018, Congress increased that goal so that the goal is now 60% of renewable energy for each of these utilities by 2030 and 100% carbon-free sources by 2045. So those to me are the two big overarching goals. Um, the, uh, the carbon neutrality goal that you mentioned and 100% carbon-free sources of electricity by 2045. Now we can talk about what exactly carbon neutrality means. We know that in 2030, the goal is 60% renewable energy. The, the law is pretty clear on what that means. What's carbon neutrality? It basically means net zero, which means that the state's going to pledge to remove as much carbon from the air as it puts in. Um, and reducing carbon emissions is a really big piece of that, but it also means potentially things like carbon removal and carbon capture and sequestration. So those are the big goals. Um, and I like to think of this, uh, this implementation strategy as breaking down into a couple of different areas. This is, these are not California's um, interim steps, I should say. This is the way that I think about it. So first, we want to electrify everything um, or as much as we can. Uh, and then, of course, if we do that, we have to clean up electricity generation to make sure we're reducing carbon emissions there. We have to be a lot more efficient in how we use electricity and other forms of energy. And then there's some cleanup work uh, to be done, which means we have to deal with um, the transition and the transitional use of fossil fuels. We have to figure out how to deal with sectors that can't easily be electrified or decarbonized. So there's, there's a lot of work outside those first three big bullets. And maybe we should start by talking about electrification, which is yeah, that like a good idea. important in California right now. Great. So, um, you know, electrify everything. And you've probably heard versions of this in the news, uh, in buildings, for example, which make up about a quarter of our, car our carbon emissions, our GHG emissions in the state. Um, we're trying to get the carbon out of buildings. So that is through a combination of things like building codes and incentives and other laws and regulations. Um, the California Energy Commission sets these building efficiency standards, which gives buildings energy budgets. Um, and they can figure out how to meet those budgets, but they can't use more energy than is in those budgets. Um, and then the California Air Resources Board, or CARB, helps propose changes to the state building codes to actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions from buildings. So that could, includes a lot of energy regulations, like regulations on electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Um, and I'll just give you an example, right? So the current requirements, they uh, require new homes, new construction homes to have rooftop solar. And new commercial buildings have to have solar plus storage systems, energy storage systems installed. Those regulations might get even stricter, right? As we're currently working, or the government's currently working on the 2025 standards. Um, the Resources Board also has zero emission standards for certain appliances. Uh, and, and so those are, are requirements at the state level. There are also things that local governments do. Berkeley prohibited new natural gas connections into new homes recently. 
the law was challenged, um, and actually a three-judge panel of the Ninth Circuit of Court of Appeals recently struck it down, arguing that this was not something for cities to do. This was not even something for states to do. This was effectively regulating what kind of appliances you could have in your home. In other words, no gas appliances. And that was something that only the federal government could do under a statute called the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. So it's a tenuous argument, in my opinion, um, and Berkeley, with support from the Biden administration, is trying to get that case reheard by all of the judges of the Ninth Circuit. We call that en banc. Um, but this is something that a lot of cities in California are looking at. This is something that the state government is looking at, is, is essentially how to reduce the use of gas in buildings to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. People, some people hate this, right? I, I don't know how you feel about your gas stove. When I told my mother about this, she was unwilling to let give away her gas stove, right? Um, she doesn't have to because she lives in an existing home, but she likes to cook on gas stoves. People get used to certain ways of life and sometimes the regulations can conflict with that. Yeah, what about transportation? I know that affects a lot of us who either own a car or are thinking about buying one. Yeah, right. Another area where this gets really personal, um, but transportation makes up close to half of our greenhouse gas emissions in the state. And transportation, of course, produces a lot of other nasty pollutants like particulate matter and the nitrogen oxide that forms smog. Um, so in California, we're specially situated because under the Federal Clean Air Act, California is the only state in the nation that gets to set its own emission standards from new cars uh, and trucks. And that was a nod to the fact that California was regulating these emissions before the federal government got into the game. Um, so there, there are conditions on that. We have to meet the conditions for a, a waiver from something called federal preemption, which we saw in the Berkeley natural gas example, um, which means that the federal law is essentially a trump. It trumps state regulation and local regulation in less there's some kind of waiver or unless there's no conflict between the two. But here there's a waiver that California can get and California has run with that authority. Uh, the Recently the CARB, the Air Resources Board adopted its advanced clean cars to regulations, uh, which the headline right that you'll see in the paper means no sales of new gas powered cars beginning in 2035. And there are interim goals uh, to get there. That's huge, right? That means if you go to buy a car in 2035, you're going to be looking at an electric vehicle. Um, if you have a used car, you can keep driving it, right? Um, but your new car will have to be electric. And they have other rules dealing with larger vehicles, um, fleets of vehicles, et cetera. We're going to need chargers for all of those vehicles, right? Um, hundreds of thousands of new publicly accessible chargers probably um, by the year 2025. So the Energy Commission is investing in, it's coordinating that effort, figuring out how to improve the customer experience at existing charging stations and networks, which I know has been frustrating uh, for some, and then requiring local governments to figure out how they're going to deploy these charging structures. It's not going to be gas stations anymore, right? It's you're going to pull up to the pump and charge your car. Um, so, so that's going to be a big piece of this as well. And of course, right, transportation planning to make sure that fewer people have to drive to get to their destinations is a big part of this too. Yeah. And I drove my first electric vehicle last month, so I understand that the better. What did you think? It was really fun. Um, I could see myself driving one, but I understand the frustrations now with finding charging infrastructure, especially if you don't have a Tesla. Yeah, that the, the, the range anxiety is real, and we have to address that if we expect people to switch over to electric cars. I have a, a Nissan Leaf that I've been driving since okay. 2018. I absolutely adore it. The thing is quiet as a whisper. Um, it's just a joy to drive, but it only has a range of about 125 um, miles. Yes. And the new leaves yeah. have better ranges than that, um, but uh, that means that we have a hybrid car as our other car. So we're gonna have to work this out um, and the technology is improving all the time. We will get there, I'm confident we'll get there. And the goals that regulators set sometimes are what leads industry and governments to get there, right? You set a high standard in the law. This was the story of all of our major federal environmental laws of the 1970s. You set a really high standard. Everybody says there's no way we can meet it. And then surprise, surprise, right? Ingenuity um, and people find a way to meet it. So I'm confident that will happen here too. Um, so we're trying to electrify everything, right? In the state. But once we electrify everything, we also have to clean up electricity generation because then everything's going to be relying 
on the electricity sector for its power. Um, and so that means getting really serious about the renewable portfolio standards, about a zero carbon future. That means building out more solar, more wind, more geothermal. In California, we have an abundance of those resources. We're very, very lucky. We have the most utility scale solar capacity in the nation. We have a lot of rooftop potential. We have two big geothermal reservoirs in the north and the south. Um, and, uh, and so we see the state agencies implementing our renewable portfolio standard, which means, as you said earlier, right, the legislature gives the broad outlines of the plan and the agencies make it real, right? They fill in the details. So they set procurement targets. This is the CPUC, the Utilities Commission. For each utility, they approve utilities plans, figuring out where they're going to get their electricity from. There's also a new requirement um, from state law, from, from the legislature, that utilities buy storage. And this is going to really help with the integration of variable resources like solar and wind into the grid. Utilities have to uh, procure about 1,300 megawatts of energy storage, and that's gonna increase over time. Uh, we're gonna meet that, there's no question. There are already 500 megawatts of storage capacity operational. There are about uh, 1,500 megawatts of storage that have been approved. That's gonna mean that when the sun isn't shining, the wind isn't blowing, that there can be stored electricity from those storage installations that can feed back onto the grid um, and smooth out supply and demand over, over those periods. Um, and then there are lots of other interesting things we need to do to make sure that our energy generation is cleaner, our electricity generation is cleaner in the state. That might involve some capture uh, of carbon emissions. It's not clear yet, um, but, but those are all really important steps that the state agencies are taking to implement those goals. Mm -hmm. And then I have my my pet favorite here, right, which is reducing energy usage and becoming more efficient. Uh, one of the ways that we do that through regulation is by creating incentives for people to change their behavior in ways that we want. So this is another way that energy regulation really hits home in California is through your rate structures, what you pay for electricity and for gas. And those rates, again, are set by the Public Utilities Commission. Um, and one thing we have in California that we don't have in a lot of the country are time of use rates. So that means that you pay for your electricity. The cost is different based on the different times of day. Uh, PG&E up here in Berkeley, where I am, has a peak pricing plan. You can opt out of it, but you're defaulted into it. And that means every day from 4 to 9 p.m., I pay more for electricity I consume. And then at those off-peak times, I pay less. And that gives me a really good incentive not to run my dishwasher, my washer dryer, not to charge my leaf during that period from 4 to 9 p.m. when everybody is asking for a lot from the electricity system and when we're having to turn on more power plants as a result. So it's a really clever way to shift demand. It can also be used, these types of programs, to incentivize people to reduce their demand overall, um, to be more efficient. Uh, and, and so that's one way that the government is influencing our decisions about when and how much electricity we consume. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think we're going to try to do, do another episode just on the duck curve and why it matters when you use your energy appliances, because that's a really big issue, especially here in California. And just to circle back to finishing our California conversation, um, does California legislation impact other states at all? Yeah, it impacts them a lot. I mean, California is one of the biggest economies in the world, right? It's fourth or fifth, depending on who you ask, in the world, right? And, um, and there's a phenomenon that a political scientist here at UC Berkeley named David Bogle identified as the California effect, whereby other jurisdictions, not just other states, right, but other countries have been steadily adopting California's stricter environmental standards. And I think this holds true when it comes to energy laws and regulations as well. Sometimes there's an actual legal mechanism that makes it easy for other states to follow California's lead, as in the Clean Air Act example that we discussed, right, where California gets to set its own more stringent auto emission standards. There's a mechanism right in the federal statute that says states, you get to choose. You can follow the federal government or you can adopt California standards. 
But then in other cases, there are states that might just want to take advantage of California's regulatory resources, right, by letting us pilot things, by letting us pioneer things, um, by relying on our state's research. There are a lot of scientists and data analysts and other experts working at the California agencies. They're, they're big. They have a lot of staff. CARB has about 1,700 staff members. That includes engineers, that includes scientists, lawyers, analysts. Um, and I think the CPUC has um, over a thousand, maybe around 1200 employees. By contrast, in the state where I used to live, Colorado, the Public Utilities Commission, which is wonderful, has about 125 permanent full-time staff. So you can see that for other states, you know, piggybacking on some of the developments in California could be really, really useful. Though I do also want to say, you know, California learns from other states as well. We learn from other jurisdictions. Um, there are national associations for our regulatory utility commissioners, for our clean air agencies, where state regulators can share ideas with each other. Um, and we're learning from states like Colorado, which was out front on a lot of oil and gas regulations because that industry was so present in the state. Um, Hawaii has been doing incredible things on performance-based rate making, where utilities are rewarded for meeting certain goals rather than just how much of their product they sell. So we're always learning from other places as well. Awesome. Uh, so as we near the end of our time here, I did want to ask about any action steps that consumers might be able to take. So as a law student, I probably want to be paying attention to laws and regulations, but what about people in non-legal fields? Do we as consumers also have a role to play in shaping energy regulations and policies? I think we all have a big role to play. I'm also very conscious that all of us lead busy lives and that different people have different amounts of time and resources that they can contribute to this. But I think there are two big ways that we as consumers um, can play a role in shaping policy. One is to stop thinking of ourselves as consumers. <laughs> and um, you know, this is this is nobody's fault. This is the way that the term has been used for a long time. It's in the media all the time, right? We are more than just the product of our consumption of energy, our consumption of products. Um, and so that means doing our part when it comes to things like conservation. Individually, it seems like this doesn't mean much, but if you aggregate it, it means a lot, right? Pay attention to how much energy you're using between 4 p.m. and 9 p.m. Those are the times when the grid is really stressed, right? Install more electric appliances if you're able, right? Install solar and storage at home if you're able. Turn off the lights when you're not in a room, right? This is what we're trying to teach my son who's in elementary school right now. And those actions really add up. If you remember last summer, uh, there was some very hot weather in California and the grid was stressed. And um, the California Independent System Operator, which operates our transmission grid in the state, thought they were going to have to move to brownouts and blackouts. But instead, what they did was send out a text. People probably remember this. You got a text saying, the grid is stressed. Please stop using so much electricity. And people responded. It was incredible. And we avoided any blackouts or brownouts. And I thought that was amazing. And that shows the power of what we can do collectively as individuals. Um, the other big thing you can do is get involved in policy. Again, if you have the time, the bandwidth, the interest, you can comment on all of these rules that are coming out of our government agencies. Anything that the California Public Utilities Commission does, anything that CARB does, anything the Energy Commission does, right? There's going to be an opportunity to provide your input in some way. So you can write in individual comments by looking on their websites. You can attend public hearings. You can get involved with organizations that do all that stuff on our behalf. So there are ways to get involved in shaping the rules that come out. And then there are ways that we can respond to make sure those rules are successful. And to end, um, I'd love to know what inspires or motivates you about the future of energy law and policy, and if there are any resources that you might recommend for people interested in learning more about energy law and policy. Mm, I'm very optimistic. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of my students these days that are not optimistic about the state of the world, about um, our future in terms of climate change, about energy policy. And what inspires me really is them. It's you all, right? Um, I see both a lot of pessimism, but still this drive, this passion, um, this, this 
this urge to do something about it. And there's so much, I think, that our young people can do that we can all do right now to assist the energy transition. Um, I don't know if you saw the victory in the Montana courts recently, a group of, um, of young people challenged the state and challenge certain laws in the state as being inconsistent with their state constitution's right to uh, a clean environment. Um, and, and they won, right? And, and so this, these, are, these are areas, lawsuits and regulations and statutes, they sound very removed, but with the right help and the right assistance, we can all participate in those arenas and, and we can make a real difference. It's pretty clear the next generation is not gonna accept a carbon-based economy um, and the catastrophic climate consequences that are going to result. So, so my students inspire me uh, every day. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah, are there other resources you'd you would recommend? Yeah, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna boost up some of our uh, University of California campus resources that I think are tremendously helpful that I follow that my students follow. Um, that includes resources coming out of our Center for Law, Energy, and the Environment right here at UC Berkeley Law. They have a really nice very clear overview of everything the state of California is doing along with some analysis. Um, and you can keep up to date on what California is doing that way. Uh, we have a blog called Legal Planet. That's a collaboration of scholars um, from across the UC campuses writing about energy and climate. Um, and my colleagues over at the Haas Energy Institute have an incredible blog as well for some uh, more economic perspectives on state level policies. Great. Yeah. So we'll link to all of these in the show notes, as well as the USC Oshagi Center for Energy Transition. So you can go and learn more about um, what these cool places are doing. Thank you so much, Professor Jacobs, for being on our show. And thank you for the important work that you do, both for students and the energy law field. Well, thank you for your work um, on this podcast. And thanks so much for having me. Well, I learned a lot from that conversation, and I hope you did, too. Next, I chat with my law school friend and classmate, Kristen, who worked on renewable energy transactions at a law firm this summer, and get her take on energy law. Here's our conversation. I'm here with my wonderful law school friend and classmate, Kristen. Thanks for coming to the show. Thanks for having me. Um, do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? <laughs> maybe tell us a little bit about um, where you're from, a little about yourself, and maybe why you're interested in energy law or what drew you to energy law. Definitely. Um, so my name is Kristen Richardson. I'm also 3L at USC Law. Um, and I think I've always been very interested. So I grew up in grew up in Houston, but um, I have a lot of family who is originally from Port Arthur, Texas, which is most people have never heard of it, but it um, has the largest oil refinery in North America there. So um, really always seeing the effects of, you know, like climate change, uh, sustainability, and how it affects black and brown communities. So it was always very like a prevalent part of my life. And so coming to law school, I always had an interest in it and really saw like the intersectionality of climate and how it, you know, just affects how we live, how we operate. So that was my initial interest in the area. So this summer you worked for a law firm in Houston, right? And with <laughs> renewable energy transactions, maybe gives a little sense of what that was like and what the firm does in that space? Definitely. So I worked at Shepard Mullen um, in the Houston office. And so they work, they, it's a very new office, but they have a uh, renewable energy practice there. And so that's a little different than the rest of the climate in Houston, because um, Houston is originally known for, you know, bread and butter, having like traditional oil and gas. Um, so, but this practice in particular focused on a lot of like solar wind and particularly a lot of um, like, power and gas trading um and it it really helped it really was a nice bridge between um you know you see traditional utility providers but also like their interaction with the local municipalities and there were some contracts that were definitely in texas but a lot also in california so you could really kind of see like how the deal was structured differently based on like the regulations in the place where the you know the power was going to be traded at um, and it was, yeah, it was a really eye-opening experience to know like what goes into just any traditional deal and then the nuance and layer components that come with working like in, you know, renewable energy in like a green space right now in this time. Yeah. 
were you focused mostly on Houston transactions or kind of across the country? Yeah, so the firm focused, well, this group, they did have like some transactions that took place in Texas, but a lot of them actually were in California um, too. So I would say like probably the mix between Texas and Cali a little bit. So that was a good, nice variety. Yeah, definitely. And so how does energy law kind of play into the law firms? Um, did it affect your, I mean, because regulations change a lot. So given the regulatory uncertainty, um, how did that affect your, maybe your client, the law firm's clients, business operations and planning? Great question. Um, so one of my first assignments was actually, um, there was a new bill that passed from the summer session in the Texas legislature. There was like HB 1500F, I think. And so it really talked about, um, it was really tackling uh, renewable energy. And so one of the things is that definitely the Texas climate isn't as open and as welcoming to, um, you know, to players in the renewable energy space. Cause I think there's a underlining sense of social and morality and economic ties to keeping everything in a traditional oil and gas sector. Um, type of field. So yeah, for our clients, um, so we had to like analyze the bill, see is there any new changes that they could be aware of. And ultimately it was going to make the cost of doing their deal a lot, a, a lot more. They had to have a lot more, you know, because Texas is in its own grid system versus other country, I'm sorry, versus other states. They they have a grid system that interplays with other different states, but Texas likes to kind of be on its own. So they, so the regulation just required like way more um, precautions um, if the grid system went out of place. So it would make a deal that, you, you know, that maybe cost like, I don't know, 5 million, maybe like 7 million. So it just like increase the cost of actually doing the deal. So, I mean, it's really in interesting though because clients really care about that. And so, you know, with, if it's higher cost somewhere else and they have to kind of make up the cost off, you know, offset it too. So it was, yeah, it was very interesting to see. Uh, and just to be clear, like who actually bore your clients? Were they like companies who make, generate the power or? Yeah, you know what? It was, it was, a it was actually really, yeah. So it was traditional kind of electric company. So um, they'll definitely be like, um, there's like a, Texas company called Intergy that that's a big Texas company that just trades with you know that you that you typically see on your electric bill like oh I'm getting my gas from Intergy but also a lot of traditional financial institutions have a commodity group that actually is also a key player in these deals too that you wouldn't think of like Fidelity investments like people that you would invest your 401k or Roth, then they have a commodity section. And so they're also a game player in these deals too. And so I think um, what makes it difficult or like always changing is that when you think of like going to gas and pumping your gas and how the prices change, so does power and electric change every day steadily too. So, you know, if the interest rates are good right now, then it's, it's great, but like everything's always tied in and just, it just fluctuates so much. Yeah, that's really interesting. <laughs> so kind of generally, like, why should we care? Like, why should the average person care about energy law and, you know, what law firms are doing in this space? <laughs> I think um, when you see the client base that law firms have, you are also really kind of knowing where the market is going and like, and really what things people care about from a financial point of view and also from maybe a policy or regulatory point of view. I think that, you know, energy is something like personal, like everybody of some sort uses energy in their everyday lives. And I think the movement right now with green move with like green energy or green finance or ESG um, puts a puts like more of a burden on corporations to think about holistically how their energy is affecting really everybody, you know, shareholders, general public, um, regulatory aspects. So I think that it's something that you can always um, feel close to. You always know it's like in your back backyard too. And then also I think it can like help really make your life better in general. Like even if you care about it or don't care about it. I think like we're all um, players in the energy field. And so it helps to just like be abreast and aware about it too. Yeah, definitely. And I'll just add, um, like law firms have done a lot of work 
for the fossil fuel industry, right, according to the Law Students for Climate Accountability, which is a student group at Yale Law School, um, between the years 2016 and 2020, the top 100 firms in the U.S. facilitated about 100, or not 100, 1.36 trillion of fossil fuel transactions and represented fossil fuel clients in 358 cases. So it sounds like fossil fuel companies do rely on lawyers to advise on projects, um, defend them in lawsuits, secure permits for projects, um, so they can play a, an important role as well in advising companies um, who are trying to do the energy transition, you know, and that kind of go, go in that direction. Um, so law firms follow the money, so to speak. Yeah. Like they, they go where the business is. And so what they do reflects the energy market and the, the trends in the energy industry. And um, so they also have the power to shape that industry. Definitely. Um, so law firms are doing work for the fossil fuel industry, but they're also transitioning into things like renewables, hydrogen, battery storage. Um, have you seen have you seen that trend this summer um, play out where clients are starting to demand more um, of that kind of work? Yeah, they are. I think that clients, um, I think with like the alarming rates of like temperatures and weird catastrophic weather things that happen like obviously there's always hurricane season in the South, but like there was a hurricane here in LA and like skyrocketing heat, you know, temperatures. I think it is in everybody's best interest to really care about what's going on with the climate. And I think that law firms are reflecting that. And also I think a good point is, is that like, um, we kind of think like energy transition means that like, absolutely, hey, we should like completely stop doing fossil fuels or oil and gas, but there are just some components to our daily life that we need oil and gas for too. So I think that, um, I think the rhetoric has been like kind of putting these two together when I really think it's it's a slow, gradual, like reliance on oil and gas and just a more increase in renewable energy in some ways, instead of like, oh, it has to be one of the other, like they're kind of pitted towards each other too. Cause I think, um, yeah, I think with the, renewable energy comes like a new sector of jobs too. And like obviously oil and gas has a traditional sector too. So yeah, just recognize that they really can go hand in hand and they don't have to like be opposing to each other as well. I think it's really important um, just as lawmakers are starting to think about things. But I think in general, there are like an kind of an increase in more like tax and like renewable credits that people are doing too that are helping make uh, the deals more financially feasible too. Cause I think like, um, I think companies, private companies really appeal to their shareholders. And so, um, and so if we can, if we can try to like do good and do well at the same time, that's like the ultimate idea. And I think, you know, the government and Biden administration has really kind of made it a point to really kind of, you know, put like green energy and renewable energy kind of on the map and like push it so much so. And so I think that is reflective in like the deals and like what what type of incentives that even private players who don't have to care about it, but should care about it can really kind of play a role in the industry too. Um, what have you seen are some of the barriers of, you know, phasing out of oil and gas? So like with the oil and gas obviously comes like energy itself, but I think for quite a lot of people, it also come like jobs and stability too. So I think if we could make the message more clear of like the impact of renewable energy, not just like in terms of, you know, health and life, but also like, oh, there's also a new set of jobs that we can use, like a, a new set of skill sets that we need to kind of still like push the message forward. I think that's really important too, because I think a lot of times people like people do like oil and gas, but people also just know that there's just, there's just so many other streams that people think of, like there's an upstream oil and gas, a downstream and all the sectors that have a role in that. Um, and so when you think about removing oil and gas, you, you could think about messing with the accountant that works on upstream stuff that's not even really tied to it, but maybe that's their biggest client space, you know? So I think, I think like pushing the more, trying to make it personal and like hit home is like, oh, there's a new sector of jobs that will be created versus like taken away. I think it's really good to kind of get away from the fear of renewable energy. And also I think that I've seen also, I think the ESG particular part of it, like the, you know, um, with companies, I think that there needs to be more cemented like regulation that's along with that. Cause I'm hearing just cause, 
you know, I, I have a good friends who are accountants who work in the ESG space and they say like, it's really like a metrics that's not really some, it's not really cemented. It's very kind of much so open to interpretation. So then they don't know how to really handle it either when they're like, when they're, they work at Chevron and, you know, we're like doing ESG, but kind of what is it? So I think people need a more like hardcore rubric guideline to like, what is this? Cause it's hard to follow something, especially from um, professions that are purely like number based or whatever like how how can we follow this if we don't if it's like if the guidelines are too squishy for us to follow so and maybe that's just something that's just going to come with time as we know more we know much better hardcore metrics or, or ranges that we can put on for these companies but right now it's very much so like it's giving more of like a PR brand versus like an actual hey this is really this metric is quantified to me exactly this. And it's, it's just, I think it needs to be more concrete. So yeah, I think those are like the barriers that are really kind of stopping, you know, renewable energy from, you know, taking off more. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so zooming out a little bit here, what would you say is the role of energy law and regulations in the energy transition? Or what would you say are the challenges or opportunities um, that you see in the energy law space? Yeah, I think the, okay, the biggest opportunity, I think in general is that it's, um, is that because it's relatively new and because more people from different professions are taking it on, I think it's a really great chance that like everybody can be a leader in education with it. So I think many times when you have like new theory, when you have like old theories, you already have like a set leader in it. But I think with renewable energy in this space, it's like everybody's starting off from the same clean slate. So you know, the undergrad, you know, student right now who's listening, who's like in environmental studies will know just as much as I do, right? Because it's still a current developing part of the law. And so I think that's always great to know that you can be a subject matter expert in it, like right now, because we're all learning at the same time. And then I think the challenges for it um, right now would, would definitely be like, I think, uh, probably the political battle on like how on on its importance um, on yeah. its existence on it um, that's pretty hard and it's it it really does vary a lot state from state so California has always had a huge emphasis on it and really is leading the forefront from it and then you have places you know that I love so much but like Texas who's not really who's going to be like probably the very last to really submit it and so when you have that fluctuation it's really hard but I also think that like government now so if people don't have to if it doesn't make feasible sense then it, then I think you should make it more of a regulation because then like we still want it to happen so how do we either do we make incentives to do it or do we make it like a require set in stone and so I really think like government's role and and the legal role like as far as making relation is really kind of gonna be the forefront of it too because um while these are like, I do think it's very important, but not if you can like paint it in a more investor friendly way, then that's going to like really get people to do it. So yeah, I was the opportunities is that we can all be subject matter experts pretty much at the same level right now because it's new and emerging, but also, yeah, I think the government really has to take a more hardcore stand set with like setting regulations that we all can like really follow. So yeah, I think like the yeah, I think the private sector will follow, you know, government's lead. And I don't think it'll be vice versa. Yeah. And it's hard to with energy law because every state, I mean, Texas has its own electricity <laughs> grid. So, so every state yeah. has its own laws and regulations. Yeah. So, so, so we'll like, all that together. Yeah. So we'll like, you know, um, what excites you about the energy transition? <laughs> um, I think it's exciting because I think when we talk about energy, we we have to talk about health. I think we have to talk about communities of color. I think we have to talk about, you know, like I think I think the intersectionality of energy, I think is really interesting. Like the conversation yeah. souls bring about too. You know, like, you know, in Louisiana where there's tons of like ore findings, there's like a huge cancer rate. And so like I think um the intersectionality of energy makes it so personal to people that I, I think it like yeah I think it's something that you like have to care about when you think about how climate really affects like all of us you know in so many like important ways so yeah I think that's what yeah. it's like me awesome. <laughs> yeah well do you have any um final words or advice for 
students who may be interested in energy law and policy? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, energy law is so broad, right? You could like be a lawyer like we are, or you could work in the policy space, or you could work in the data space, or you could work in like the community engagement and build a relationship space. I think I would encourage everybody to like, it's so it's such a broad field to maybe pick a skill that they feel like they do really, really well and try to tackle that part of, you know, the energy. For example, like if you're really good with data and analysis, like there's totally a sector there. If you're really good with like finance, you could totally help with like the renewable energy credit and like bringing deals together too. If you're like really good with policy, you know, you could be on the hill, like advocating for new changes, law. So I think that um, it's such a big and it's such a big and broad field, but I think like maybe finding like your slice of the pie and what skill you want to bring to it to help it, I think would be like more concrete and it would help you just along the way. Amazing. Thank you so much for being on the show. No problem. Thanks for having me. I think one key takeaway from these conversations is that energy law and regulations affect all of us. Energy issues can be really technical and complex, and energy law can seem especially elusive and daunting, even for people in the legal field. But energy law shapes the choices that we make. It encourages us to do certain things like buy EVs and solar panels and heat pumps. We all play a role in shaping energy regulations and policies, and we can all do something about it whether it's by getting more actively involved in our local communities or being more mindful of how we consume energy on a daily basis. The energy transition is up to the changes we are willing to make as individuals and as a society. So I hope that this episode helps you understand a little more of the energy transition because the energy transition is up to you. Well, that's all I have for you today. I hope you enjoy these conversations as much as I did. And thank you so much for tuning in to the energy transition talk. You can find the resources we discussed in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you can automatically get access to our new episodes. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have any questions or comments or topics you want to hear about in future episodes, please visit our YouTube page. We'd love to hear your feedback. I want to thank the USC Urshaki Center for Energy Transition, which aims to develop innovations in energy technologies and foster the transition to a low carbon future for sponsoring this podcast. Special thanks to Professor Jacobs and Kristen, our guests for today as well as Abby, our technical guru, for their important contributions to our podcast. Jim and Paulina will be back for the next episode, so stay tuned. I'm Justine, your host for today, signing off from the Energy Transition Talk.